This test consists of three parts, Part A, Part B and Part C. Part A. You will listen to two separate health professional patient consultations extracts. There is a total of 24 questions. For extract 1, there are 1 to 12 questions. For extract 2, there are 13 to 24 questions. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. At the start of each extract, you will hear a beep sound. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. Look at the notes for extract 1. You hear a physiotherapist talking to a new patient called Ray Sands. Complete the notes with the information you hear. You have to write down a word or a phrase. You will get 30 seconds to look at the notes. It's Mr. Sands, isn't it? Uh, that's right, uh, Ray Sands. Now, I think you've been referred to me because you're suffering from sciatica. Uh, that's right. Uh, not for the first time, actually. OK. Well, I've got some notes here, but perhaps you can tell me in your own words... Perhaps you can tell me in your own words about any previous bouts of sciatica you've had, uh, what treatment you had, what worked for you, anything else you can remember. right -o. Well, it all started when I hurt my back, ooh, about uh, 18 months ago now. OK. I was giving somebody, a hand, giving somebody a hand with a heavy suitcase and I felt it go, oh. you know, oof, just like that. Mm. Anyway, I slowly got over that, despite occasional flare-ups. And then, out the blue, about a year ago, sciatica developed. Mm. Mm. And it was six months t till that finally cleared up altogether. Now it's come back in, well, in the last month or so, I'd say. I see. And your GP said it was sciatica? Yeah. I had this pain all the way down my right leg, mm -hmm. and she said the real problem was in my back because the sciatic nerve was getting trapped. Right. I mean, I'm telling you, this was no ordinary pain. It was really intense. Mm -hmm. I mean, to the extent that I couldn't stand for very long, couldn't walk hardly any distance, I couldn't sleep. Oh, I mean, the most frustrating bit for me was that I couldn't even turn over in bed. It just hurt so much. I just just couldn't get comfortable. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I'd have, well, a sort of um, tingling feeling in my calves as well. Right. But then at other times, my whole leg just oh, felt a bit numb, really. It, it was weird. And of course, I couldn't go to work. I'm an event organiser, so I travel about a lot. I'm setting things up for conferences, lugging stuff around, you know. And so there was no way I could manage any of that, the state I was in. OK. So how was this treated? Well, uh, in the first instance, I was given painkillers, obviously. Uh, ibuprofen, as far as I can remember. Right. Uh, and I was told to put compression packs on the affected area. I mean, that did ease the pain a little, but I was still housebound, practically speaking. OK. Uh, then the GP sent me, to, P sent me to see an osteopath and I got some treatment there, but see, it didn't seem to make much difference. Right. So I was referred to a sports injury specialist, of all things. Uh, and he did um, a number of things that did seem to ease things a little, like working on my spine and lower legs. Mm -hmm. Oh, and he, he gave me a set of exercises to do at home. I see. Um, any other treatment? Uh, oh, yeah, I almost forgot. There was this course of injections and I went for various other therapies like ultrasound and another one where they do... Well, they use, like, electrical impulses. Mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly what it's called. OK. 
Um, at one point, I even considered acupuncture. But by then, the other things were beginning to take effect and the symptoms were subsiding. So uh, I gave it a miss. Mm -hmm. So which of these various treatments do you feel was most effective? Uh, what made the difference? Mm, well... I couldn't say for certain because it all went on for four months without much improvement, really. Then it wasn't until suddenly in the fifth month things changed quite dramatically. So to be honest with you, I think it was the combination treatments gradually taking effect and coming together rather than one single thing making the difference. OK. And did anyone ever talk to you about what might be causing the problem? Well... I think everyone assumed that a slipped disc was behind it all, but right. was never actually confirmed as that. I mean, I know there is this other condition uh, where you get a lot of pain in the buttocks, but mm, that wasn't my experience. OK. And did anyone talk to you about aspects of your lifestyle that might be... Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. Look at the notes for extract 2. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Mr. Greg Matthews. Complete the notes with the information you hear. You have to write down a word or a phrase. You will get 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. May I know your problem? Well, doctor, he is Mr. Greg Matthews, my husband. Actually, he fell down yesterday morning when he was trying to put his boots on top of the staircase. He fell down 20 steps and he has lost his consciousness. He has lost his consciousness. He was evaluated by a local clinic and was amnestic at the time of examination. A HCT scan was taken and thereafter they referred to your hospital. Well, what's his age? 72, doctor. Does he drink or smoke? No, doctor. May I know his past medical history? Well, he had atrial fibrillation, right hemisphere stroke last year with associated left hemiparesis and amaurosis fugax. This was followed by a right coronary artery for 98% stenosis. However, the stroke symptoms and signs were resolved. Degenerative joint disease, Total, re total replacement of right knee two years ago, venous stasis with no history of deep vein thrombosis. What medications is he taking? Lasix, 40 milligrams once in a day. Zantac, 150 milligrams once in a day. Lenoxin, 0.125 milligrams once daily. Capotin, 2.5 milligrams twice a day. Salsalate, 750 milligrams thrice a day. ASA, 325 milligrams once in a day. Ginsana, 100 milligrams twice a day. Is he allergic to any medicine? No, doctor. May I know his history of illness? Well, his father expired of a myocardial infarction at 70, and his mother died of complications of a dental procedure. Well, his physical examination reports show blood pressure 157 over 86. 
heart rate and irregular respiratory rate, 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Reflexes are symmetric. Plantar responses reflex her bilaterally. His cardiovascular regular rate and rhythm without murmur. H-E-E-N-T shows abrasion over the right forehead. Extremity, distal right leg edema and erythema just above the ankle. Well, I have reviewed his previous HCT scan, which reveals a left parietal epidural hematoma. Right lower extremity revealed a fracture of the right lateral malleolus for which he was casted. I am ordering a repeat HCT scan to see if there is any change in the epidural hematoma. Upon seeing the reports, I shall suggest further treatments. Part B. You will listen to six short workplace extracts. For each extract, you will get one multiple choice question, A, B, or C. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C which fits best according to what you hear. You will get 15 seconds to read each question before you listen to the extract. At the start of each extract, you will hear a beep sound. Question. 25. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining liver flukes. You will get 15 seconds to read the question with options. Doctor, what are liver flukes? Liver flukes is a parasite disease. A patient may never know he has liver flukes. Even the doctors at times may not diagnose the condition because the symptoms of fasciolysis are similar to many other conditions. There are, chan there are chances that a person with liver flukes living may never develop fasciolysis. Others may develop fasciolysis many years after the liver flukes entered the body. A person cannot transmit liver flukes accidentally to someone else unlike other parasite diseases. Liver flukes make their way from the instance to the liver once it enters the body. To get into the liver, the liver flukes must burrow through the lining of the liver causing pain in the upper right abdomen. The two types of liver flukes that can affect people are 
fasciola hepatica, and fasciola gigantica. Question 26. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining a telectasis. You will get 15 seconds to read the question with options. A partial or complete collapse of one or both the lungs is called atelectasis. That occurs when tiny air sacs in the lungs, called alveoli, deflate. The collapse of the lowest lobes in both the lungs is called bibasilar atelectasis. The lobes of the lungs are filled with millions of tiny sacs, called alveoli, which are arranged in clusters and surrounded by blood vessels. When a person breathes, the alveoli allow their blood to collect oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. During bibasilar atelectasis, the alveoli in the lower lobes of the lungs deflate and stop performing this crucial task, therefore blocking oxygen from reaching the vital organs, life-threatening at times. Question 27 you hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about outcomes of a TB skin test. You will get 15 seconds to read the question with options. Doctor, can you explain to me the outcomes of a TB skin test? Well, the outcomes for TB skin tests are not always clear-cut. The main consideration in a TB test is the size of the bump on the arm. If the bump is smaller than 5 millimeters, then the test result is, con result is considered negative to TB. In a case where the test bump is larger than 5 millimeters, then the test result is considered positive. But we have to be very cautious about false positive and false negative. At times, patients vaccinated against TB using the Bacillus calmet garin can show a false positive result for TB. There is also a possibility that when the patients infected with bacteria similar to TB, false negative result happens when a person has a weak immune system or has been exposed to pathogens such as smallpox or measles. Patients infected with TB very recently and very old TB patients can also show false negative test results. Question 28 You hear an optometrist talking to a patient who's trying contact lenses for the first time. You will get 15 seconds to read the question with options. Now, you've had the lenses in for a few minutes. How are they feeling? Not bad. I thought I'd feel them actually touching my eyes, that they'd be sore or prickly, but I can't feel much at all. My eyes do feel a bit watery, though. It's OK. You've just used too much solution. Hmm. Now, in a few minutes, I'll get you to try taking them out and inserting them again by yourself. I had no trouble taking them out earlier, but I'm not confident about putting them in. I worry I'll press too hard. That's unlikely to happen. Things look rather distorted, though. I mean, I can't make out the letters on that chart. Any of them? Uh, those lower down. Let's give things another minute to settle down. Question 29. You hear a senior nurse talking about a new initiative that has been introduced on her ward. You will get 15 seconds to read the question with options.
One of our key priorities is improving communications between staff, patients and patients' families. We recently introduced a scheme called Dear Doctor, which involves giving each patient a card where they can make a note of any questions or concerns that they themselves have. They can also talk to their families during visiting time, or even on the phone, and see if there's anything else they'd like to add. The cards are then collected and given to the doctor before the ward round. We're really pleased with the response. Patients used to say that they only thought of the things they felt they needed to discuss when it was too late, so the cards give them a better chance to bring up whatever's on their minds. In fact, it's been so successful that we're going to roll it out on all wards in the hospital. Question 30. You hear a nurse asking a colleague for help with a patient. You will get 15 seconds to read the question with options. Uh, Kathy, could you help me with the patient in bed 103? The woman who had surgery two days ago. Oh yes, she's due for discharge today, isn't she? Does her pain relief need topping up again? I thought she wasn't very comfortable this morning. Oh, she's on a reasonably low dose, but she's coping. Mm. She, mm. she needs her chest drains removing, though, and she's got herself into a bit of a state. Ah, well, that's a two-person job anyway, so I'll come with you. Has the consultant seen her? I know there was some concern yesterday about her condition mm. and the level of the fluids draining into the bags. Oh, uh, he's cleared her for removal of them today, but I think some reassurance might be needed first. Right. I might just check her analgesia and give her more before we go ahead. OK. Part C. You will hear two different extracts. In each extract, you will hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the, to the audio. At the start of each extract, you will hear a beep sound. Now, look at the extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear a neurologist call Dr. Frank Madison giving a presentation about the overuse of painkillers. You have 90 seconds 130 minutes to read questions 31 to 36.
I'm Dr. Frank Madison, and I'm a neurologist with a special interest in the overuse of painkillers, particularly of opioids, something experts are now calling the silent epidemic. Now, we've all seen the stereotypical images of addicts hooked on recreation, stereotypical images of addicts hooked on recreational drugs, but addiction to painkillers like opioids has a much less familiar public face. From what I've seen, one reason for this is that the range of people affected makes them less easy to pigeonhole. I mean, there's no typical age, social class, and so on. And of course, most people seeking help for opioid overuse were initially prescribed the medication by their own doctors for pain relief. Uh, this highlights a major part of the problem. Physicians often pay little attention to the possible risk of addiction. They need to look at patients' personal histories and assess the risk, considering things like depression and anxiety disorders, before prescribing opioids. In recent years, there's been a dramatic increase in opioid prescriptions. I see a pattern not just of GPs overprescribing, of GPs overprescribing, but of GPs inappropriately prescribing. Sure, people want their pain relieved immediately. That's understandable. But proper pain management requires lengthy face-to-face -face input, which time pressures don't allow. So easier alternatives have become the default option. What's more, although opioids can provide effective relief in the short term, they shouldn't be the automatic first-line therapy. Many alternatives do exist, and they're no more costly. People generally think of pain as a direct symptom of a affected area, but pain is an extremely complex subject, and it's one that used to be underrepresented in medical education. Thankfully, that's no longer the case, and doctors now realise that when a patient complains of acute back pain, that pain may not be due to a clear and treatable disease, but that such pain often presents in people with other medical problems. And these need investigation. Although there are distinct types of physical pain, all too often I see sufferers lumped together in one category, which means that unfortunately not all not all treatments are going to work equally well. For example, we first need to know is the pain caused by inflammation as opposed to nerve damage. Establishing this makes initial mistreatment far less likely, meaning that treatment is more effective and the risks of long-term problems are reduced. But it's not just opioids we need to watch. Patients often self-treat with readily available painkillers like paracetamol, and while such drugs play an essential role in pain management, people still need to know more about them. We've been pretty successful in publicising the dangers of accidental overdose, and clear information's given about the effects of taking these drugs long term. So public awareness about increased tolerance levels is also gradually improving. Many doctors also now actively warn patients about the spiral of taking higher and higher doses for pain relief. Worryingly, though, I've seen cases where people on drug regimes for other conditions inadvertently take painkillers, which add a potentially hazardous ingredient to the mix already in their system. This is something which needs urgent attention. I'd like now to talk about an osteoarthritic patient who was referred to me. A 30-year-old woman, let's call her Anne, suffering from sarcoidosis, an autoimmune disease leading to chronic organ inflammation. She was prescribed various drugs, but though the, though the disease was soon brought under control, the pain lingered, with Anne gradually becoming dependent on prescription opioids. Typically, she was terrified of stopping them, yet the more she took, the worse she felt. The thing is, her prescription would have been ideal for short term pain, like that following surgery, but should never have been given for the chronic pain she was experiencing. And we all know that living with medication dependency has devastating consequences, not only on social well-being, but also on ability to function professionally, as was the case for Anne. 
She eventually went on long-term sick leave, as often happens in such cases. Thankfully, Anne's now much better. Having recognised her dependence, and with the necessary support, tools and techniques, she's now off painkillers. The crucial is to prevent dependence in the first place. Anne's GP prescribed opioids in good faith, aiming at pain reduction, but failed to set an end date for these. He hadn't anticipated the possibility of eventual drug reliance, this being new territory to him. Anne couldn't hide the visible res- couldn't hide the visible results of the quantities she was eventually taking, so her GP questioned her about intake. She reluctantly admitted supplementing her prescription from sources like friends and family, something her GP had suspected but hadn't investigated. Anne says that drugs weren't fixing her problem, and though withdrawal took several tough months, Extract 2, question 37 to 42. You hear the monologue of a physician giving a lecture on delusions of grandeur and its treatments. You have 90 seconds, 130 minutes to read questions 37 to 42. Usually, the grade and type of a cancer is clear when the cells are observed under a microscope after routine processing and staining. However, this is not always the case. At times, the pathologist requires to use other procedures also to diagnose the cancer. Histochemicals also to diagnose the cancer. Histochemical stain tests use various chemical dyes that are attracted to certain substances in some types of cancer cells. For instance, the mucicarmine stain is attracted to mucus. Droplets of mucus inside a cell exposed to this stain will look pink-red under a microscope. This stain is useful if the cancer cell is suspected for an adenocarcinoma in a lung biopsy. Adenocarcinomas can produce mucus, so by detecting pink-red spots in lung cancer cells, pathologists will decide if the diagnosis is adenocarcinoma. Besides being helpful in sorting out different kinds of tumors, 
Other types of special stains are used in the lab to identify microorganisms, such as fungi and bacteria in tissues. This is significant because the cancer patients may develop infections as a side effect of treatment or even due to the cancer itself. It is also essential in cancer diagnosis because some, inf some infectious diseases cause lumps to form that can be confused with a cancer tumor until histochemical stains prove that the patient has an infection and not cancer. Immunohistochemical stains or immunoperoxidase stains are another significant category of diagnosis. The basic principle of this procedure is that an immune protein called an antibody will attach itself to antigens, which are on or in the cell. Each type of antibody identifies and attaches to antigens that fit it exactly. To find out whether the antibodies have been attracted to the cells, chemicals are added that make the cells change color only if a certain antibody is present. Immunohistochemical stains are very useful in diagnosing certain types of cancers. For instance, a routine biopsy of a lymph node may contain cells similar to cancer. However, the pathologist may not be able to distinguish whether the cancer originated in the lymph node or elsewhere in the body and has spread to the lymph nodes. In case the cancer originated in the lymph node, the diagnosis would be lymphoma. Or else, if the cancer originated in another part and spread to the lymph node, it could be metastatic cancer. This distinction is very essential because treatment depends on the type of cancer. Often, cytometry is used to diagnose the cells from lymph nodes, bone marrow, and blood samples. It is very precise in diagnosing the exact type of lymphoma or leukemia. It also helps distinguish lymphoma from non-cancer diseases in the lymph nodes. Flow cytometry is also used to measure the amount of DNA, DNA in cancer cells called ploidy. Instead of using antibodies to diagnose protein antigens, cells are treated with special dyes that react with DNA. If the DNA amount is normal, then the cells are said to be diploid. If the DNA amount is abnormal, the cells are categorized as aneuploid. Aneuploid cancers of most organs tend to grow and spread faster than diploid ones. Another significant purpose of flow cytometry is to measure the S phase fraction, which is the percentage of cells in the sample that are in a certain stage of cell division, called the synthesis or S phase. The more cells in the S phase, the faster the tissue is growing and the more aggressive the cancer will be. Like flow cytometry, image cytometry tests use dyes that react with DNA. However, instead of suspending the cells in a stream of liquid and analyzing them with a laser, this method uses a digital camera and a compu computer system to measure the amount of DNA in cells on a microscope slide. Image cytometry can also determine the ploidy of cancer cells.